Good morning and welcome everybody to SEC Chem Meeting 2021. We continue today with our theme, making disciples and building communities. And at CCS, we are looking at balancing emotions. We continue with our workshops. Today, we are looking at how conflict unbalances our emotions. And our speaker today is Karen Holford. We are going to open with a word of prayer from Hannah. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for this wonderful day. Father, we just want to thank you that the sun is shining outside and people are here to listen to your word. Father, today we ask that you speak through Karen as she takes us through conflict. We ask that whatever information that we're given will help us in our daily lives so that we can avoid conflict in every way. Father, we just ask that you continue to be with each person in this room. You know their health, their hearts, their minds. I pray that you be with everyone. You know what's going on for them. We ask that you continue to lead them and guide them. And as they hear your word, may they be blessed today. In Jesus' name, have we prayed. Amen. Amen. Hello, everybody. My name is Karen Holford, and I'm the Family Ministries Director for the Trans-European Division. I'm also a family therapist, and when I lived in Scotland, I did some work with the Scottish Centre for Conflict Resolution, and I learned more about how we can work together to solve our conflicts. And that's what I'll be sharing with you today, because conflict is something that we all face. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are the greatest peacemaker in the universe. You are bringing together an incredibly broken world and finding resolution and reconciliation. And we thank you for that special work you are doing. Help us to become peacemakers like you, to bring about reconciliation and healing in the relationships and communities where we live today. Through Jesus' name, amen. So today I'm going to be sharing a fresh perspective on conflict looking at things in quite a different way. Because normally when we think about conflict, we think about a conflict or an argument that has happened, and then we think, how can we fix it? But today we're gonna to look at what happens before conflicts to see how we can use that information to reduce the amount of conflicts that we have in our life. And let's think about this as I prayed, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. So every time we work for peace in relationships, we are doing God's work. We are children of God. And that is a wonderful thing for us to participate in. And it's really important for us to be peacemakers in this world because unresolved conflict leads to broken relationships. And relationship breakdown has a really negative effect on people's mental health. When I was living in Scotland, where there are 5 million people, 4,000 teens and young people a year became homeless because of conflict in their family homes. And that's tragic that so many lives affected and broken and, and hurting and possibly destroyed even through homelessness and conflict. And many people also leave our church because of conflict in their homes or between them and other people at church. So it's a really big problem for all of us. When we think about being peacemakers, we have some character strengths that can help us to solve our conflicts better. We need to think about how proud are we or how humble are we? The more humble we are, the more likely we are able to work out with other people, a win-win solution where everybody feels that um, it's been a good solution for them and the peace has been achieved. People who are generous, accepting, forgiving, people who believe the best in others, people who are kind and caring, and people who don't have to control everyone around them are much more likely to have peacemaking characters. And the opposite of that, people with the pride and selfishness, critical, judgmental, suspicious, cynical, people who hurt others, who are uncaring at times or need to control and have their own way, they tend to cause more of the conflicts or make them worse. So we need to be aware of who are we what kind of character strengths do we bring into a conflict situation? And are they helping or are they hurting? 
when we're in conflict with others, our emotional balance is important because when we have a good emotional balance, we're much more able to manage the conflicts and crisis around us and deal with our emotions. A good emotional balance is when we have about three times more positive emotions in frequency and intensity than negative emotions. So positive emotions fill us up and help us to flourish. And the negative emotions are those that drain the energy out of us and make us feel like it's, it's hard work to, to carry on. When our emotions are dipping into a negative ratio, that's two to one or less, that's two to one positive to negative then we're much more likely to hurt others when we're in a conflict with them. And that then has a negative effect on their emotional well-being and often ours as well. So we get into a, a negative emotion cycle, which always makes conflicts worse. When our emotions are in a, in a positive uplifted ratio of at least three to one, then we are less likely to have conflict with others and better equipped to solve things peace, peacefully and less likely to hurt each other. The draining negative emotions are these. They are anger, sadness, guilt, shame, fear, disgust, stress, frustration, contempt and arrogance, etc. Because they, they affect our relationships badly. They affect the way we see ourselves. They hurt us as well. And the uplifting and positive emotions are love, joy, peace, laughter, hope, gratitude, inspiration, wonder, having interesting hobbies, being valued, et cetera. They all help us to feel good and live the more abundant life that Jesus wanted us to live. We can't choose the emotions that we have in response to life. Life happens, we feel, and we can deal, we deal with those emotions. But even when we are in a, you know, a challenging experience, we can still choose to experience positive emotions. And so even though the emotions have happened to us and we're feeling worn down or exhausted by them, we can say, I can choose to experience joy. I can choose to experience wonder. I can choose to be kind to someone and help them and me experience love. I can choose to have something to look forward to and share hope with someone else. I can choose to get involved in my interesting hobby and maybe share it with someone else. And whenever we choose the positive emotions, when we're experiencing negative emotions, it helps to lift us up and balance us so we can deal better with the negative emotions. Because, you know, even when you're grieving, even when there's a big sadness in your life, that's not the whole of your emotions. You can still choose, and it's okay to choose to say, yes, this big sad thing has happened. I'm working through it. I'm processing my grief. But at the same time, I can still thank God for this and this. I can still look out the window and be filled with wonder as I walk along the road and as I see the sunset. So we can still choose those moments of positive experience, no matter what is happening in our lives. And that helps us to keep a positive emotional balance. So how can we experience some of the positive emotions to help us? We can do loving things for someone else, something kind, we can experience joy. Try listing 100 things that bring you joy and choose one each day to do. Then be grateful. Thank God for 10 things that he's given to you or more if you can, or thank a person who's blessed you. Look forward to something, do your enjoyable activity, laugh at something funny, watch a funny movie, share a joke, tell each other the funny stories of life or experience peace, focus on a Bible verse, light a candle, sit quietly, take deep breaths like blowing bubbles and just let peace flood into your body that way. It's a natural way to experience peace. Or wonder, focus on nature and God's creation. Think about something that truly inspires you. Think about what you do well, what is valued by other people and know that your life is valued and valuable and that what you do blesses God and others. These are just a few of the ways that we can experience the positive emotions that can help us to rebalance our negativity and help us to be in a better and more healthy place, to love others and to have um, healthy relationships where we're more likely to reduce our conflicts. We need to remember that conflict is normal. Every relationship experiences some degree of conflict because we're all uniquely different. 
and the quality of our relationship affects how we experience and handle our conflicts. Well-managed conflicts are designed to help us explore our differences, to talk about them, to experience empathy for each other's needs and perspective and, and stories from their life and look for better solutions together where we can both flourish, both do well, both enjoy the outcome. And that leads to stronger, warmer, closer relationships that tend to have fewer and less heated conflicts. So conflict is complex. You know, there's probably no such thing as a simple conflict. They're mostly messy and complicated and they're very rarely simple solutions. Because when we have a conflict and we're filled with powerful emotions, all sorts of things have contributed to how we're experiencing that conflict, how we're experiencing the other person, how we think about what's happening, the fears that we might have around conflict, and all of those things get jumbled together and make it quite difficult for us to work our way through conflict. So we're gonna look and see some of the things that we can do to reduce our conflicts. We also need to understand basic conflict styles. So the arrow on the left pointing up, that's how important um, you are. How important is yourself and winning? And the bottom line is how important is the relationship and, and caring? So they're two different dimensions. So the more someone wants to win and the less they care about the relationship, they want to direct and control the conflict. I'm gonna win and you're gonna lose. But that leads to resentment in the other person. It leads them to distrust you and fear you and to even avoid you. And this is often where relationships are broken down um, quite severely because um, the people on the other side of the conflict, the, the losers, just uh, don't want to be engaged in that relationship anymore. And then there's the people who are not particularly bothered about winning and they don't particularly care for the relationship. And sometimes we experience those when we have an encounter in the street with someone we're never going to see again or in the grocery store. And we just say, OK, you lose, I lose. You know, neither of us are going to win here. Um, and we, we just avoid the situation. Um, but that can lead to silence and coldness if it's in an ongoing relationship. And the unresolved conflict can cause a big boulder there and, and really hurt both of them. Then there is harmonizing. That's where I'm not that bothered about winning, but I really care about the relationship. And so I will say, look, I don't mind losing. You, you win, it's fine. I'm quite happy for you to win, but it can become unbalanced, especially if one is always saying, I lose and you win. One is being overly submissive and one is winning and thinking that is the normal way to go through life. But when they have conflicts, they will always win. And that can be not a useful thing to learn. So we need to be aware that even in those situations, we need to help people to find a balance of win-win collaborative solutions. In the middle, there's compromising, which says, well, I win some and you win some. That's fair, isn't it? But that can be competitive. Well, you won the last three, so this time it's my turn to win, no matter what the issue. And that's not particularly helpful either. The best thing to go for wherever possible is collaborating. I win and you win. This takes time, negotiation, takes creativity to find a way that we can find a middle ground where we can both feel this is a good place for us to sort out our conflict. And both of us end up being happy. We get to know each other better, we understand, we go through a healthy process and each of us feels like, well, that was good. We came to a good solution there. It wasn't what either of us expected, but it was good. We need to be aware of the role of conflict in people's reasons for leaving the Adventist church. So when the um, Adventist group that do the statistics for the church looked at why people left the church, the primary trigger, the main reason for people leaving our church, 62% related to conflict in their home, in their relationships at church, wherever. And when they looked at the second reason why people left the church, 31% of those issues were related to conflict. And when they looked at the third reason for people living, leaving the church, if they prioritized them, it was also conflict. So we can see that conflict has a powerful effect on people leaving our church. And that leads to all kinds of negative and difficult emotions within those people, their families, the churches that they were engaged with. And so the, the negative ripples of those experiences can, can ripple out and affect other people. And that is why 
um, conflict is such a primary reason why people are leaving our church. So we're winning people, we're doing wonderful things to win people, but then the conflict people are experiencing in their lives and their churches is pushing them out again. So we're going to look at conflict reduction because we probably cannot eliminate conflict in our lives really. And rather than look at conflict resolution, which looks what has happened after the conflict, look and see what can happen before the conflict to reduce the amount of conflicts we have and the heat and power and emotionality of them all. Because it's much better to nurture warm and healthy relationships where conflicts are less likely and differences are more likely to be quickly and easily resolved. It's much easier to do that work than to fix the mess afterwards. And so this is where we need to focus our attention and our actions in our homes, churches, wherever we are on conflict reduction, proactively creating relationships where conflicts are less likely to happen. Sue Johnson did a big study on couples in conflict. For 25 years, she studied couples having arguments and she listened and listened and listened to try and find out what is really going on here. And slowly over time, she realized that most of the time, couples were not arguing about what they were arguing about, not the topic of discussion, like about the children or the money or the in-laws or whatever, whatever. Underneath, there were some big questions, big questions about, do you care? And big questions really about attachment. Are we, are we connected here? Do you love me and care about me? Do you appreciate me? Are you able to understand what I'm feeling right now? Can you empathize with me and understand what I'm feeling here? Can you see when I'm struggling and are you willing to come alongside and help me? And will you always be there for me? Are you committed to me? Can I trust you and depend on you? We're all asking the question, do you really care about me? And the more cared for we feel, the more we experience love together, um, then the less likely we are to argue which I think is why Jesus so much put so much emphasis on us loving one another and, and Paul as well. He wanted to create churches where there were healthy relationships and people weren't leaving because of conflicts. So when we answer these big questions in our relationships well, we strengthen attachment, reduce aloneness and lower the likelihood of painful conflict. Happy couples will still have conflicts, but they're less likely to be destructive and long lasting. And happy couples know how to soothe each other and repair the relationship quickly after a conflict. You know, um, we often say, you know, sort your problems out. Don't let the uh, um, sun go down on your wrath. Sort your problems out before the end of the day. And now we know this is so important. Recent research shows that you must repair before bedtime because then the, the conflict is in a part of the brain where you can come in, we sort it out, and then it's dealt with. But if you sleep on it, it seems to go in deeper and cause more pain, anxiety, even depression. So it is really important to try and repair conflictual and broken relationships as soon as you can. And both of you to work together on that or all of you. So how do we do these relationships where there is less conflict? Be loving and kind. We need regular expressions of mutual kindness. Each person being kind to the other in the way they speak, write, email, act, etc. Being kind and loving reduces conflicts. So does gratitude, appreciating one another, because it's often resentment that fuels bitter conflicts. If I don't feel appreciated, then I'm going to feel more unhappy and more irritable and maybe more naggy. So the more appreciated we feel, the less likely we are to argue and fight, and the more likely we are to collaborate. Be understanding and empathic. Think about the other person's feelings. Listen to their feelings. Express your compassion. Notice what they're feeling. Notice when people around you are sad and down or tired and exhausted and show your care for them. As Paul says, be sad with people when they're sad and happy when they're happy. Connect with them and show that you care because when we connect on an emotional level and we feel understood, then our relationship becomes stronger and bonded and share tasks together, ask how you can help, know the things they hate doing, do them together. Don't let anyone in your house or work struggle on their own because that builds up resentment. Come alongside and help them and they will have less arguments with you. Paul says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, 
we will fulfill the law of Christ. So support each other in the challenges of life. And I'm a couple therapist and quite often when I see couples that are going through difficulties, the kindness has gone out of their relationship. So I talk to them about the last time they did something kind for each other or the last time that the spouse did something kind for them. And quite often it's a long time ago. So we think about what they did earlier in their marriage to show kindness. And then we ask them to try an experiment of secretly doing kind things for each other and seeing if it makes a difference in the relationship. Notice when the other person has done something kind, show your appreciation and write it down. Or even say, if you'd rather not be secretive, say, I wanted to be kind to you, so I, I've done this. You might not always get it right, but when they see that you're trying to be kind, that really helps. And if you don't feel like be, being kind, well, just do it anyway, because that's how love grows. We love because God first loved us. So if we want someone to love, we have to be responsible for loving them first. We need to protect our relationships because when we're insecure in a relationship, it tends to fuel conflict. If you're in a committed relationship, let the other person know you are committed to them. Don't say, oh, if you do that, I'm gonna walk out and those sorts of things because when they feel unsafe and unsettled, you raise their anxiety and that creates like a really strong place where conflicts are more likely to happen. When people don't feel safe, when they feel anxious, then they feel more on edge with the negative emotions and that tends to um, make conflicts go more negatively. Give people your full attention, listen to them, avoid doing and saying things that make them feel afraid of you because perfect love casts out fear. So conflict escalates. When we experience criticism, a lack of support and connection, little appreciation, little kindness, it's much harder for our brains to handle conflict well because we're already in a state of negative emotions, of stress, anxiety, and fear. And they stimulate the hypothalamus and the adrenal glands. And they produce cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And then when that's running through our bodies, we're much more likely to be verbally aggressive, to shout, to hurt each other's feelings and even become violent. We stop being able to empathize and care when there's too much stress hormone in our body from our negative emotions. And it's much harder for us to respond well and listen well to them. And when fight or flight reactions like this dominate our behavior and our feelings, it becomes increasingly difficult to be thoughtful and selfish and caring. So the more negative emotions we have, we're more likely to start a conflict and let it escalate into something that's really big and scary. But we can help our brains to manage conflict better. And we do this by showing empathy for each other, compassion, kindness, support and appreciation. And they release the hormone oxytocin into our system, which is a really feel good, love kind of um, hormone that courses through our body. And when we help people to feel loved, and help this oxytocin to flow through their body, then they're more likely to be happy, loved, and loving. And in that context, our brains can manage conflict better. When we feel safely connected to other people, we can also connect more easily with the cognitive and reflective parts of our brain that help us to empathize, help us make good choices, help us to calm down and be rational and reasonable, and be wise, kind, creative, and humble in trying to find solutions together for our problems. So when you want to bring up something difficult that you think might be something that could turn into a conflict, pick your time carefully. You know, quite often we wait till the person comes home, we were stewing on it all day, and the minute they walk through the door, we pounce on them and tell them everything. That is not a good time. They're tired, they're stressed. They're already high on probably stress hormone like cortisol, and you have just added a load of stress when they wanted to calm down. And that will often catapult them into feeling lots of negative emotions, which will then affect their response to you. So if you want them to respond well, choose a time when you're both relaxed. Think of the warmest and kindest way to approach the topic. Don't just go right in there and be critical. Show that you understand the other person. Show that you see what they would like in the situation. Show that you care about them. Maybe make them a cup of tea and give them a nice, whatever treat they like, a, you know, a nice warm muffin out the oven or something like that. 
and create a warm place to talk about it, appreciate them, say some kind things so that you're experiencing positive emotions together. And give the other person time to think about the issue before discussing it, because you might have thought about it for a long time and worked it all out in your head, but this may be totally new to the other person and they need time to reflect on it too. Because if you suddenly ambush them with a topic they've never thought about, they, they might feel anxious and, and afraid and confused and stressed, and then you're going to um, stimulate those negative emotions again. And the cortisol, which means that they may be more likely to respond to you in a stressful way. And if someone ambushes you by a potential conflict, just say something like this. You know what, I can see this is a really important issue for you. And I would like to give it some serious thought too, because I care about you. And so I just want to really think about this carefully so I can choose my best response and, and think about what I'm gonna say well. Is it okay if we discuss this tomorrow? So by doing that, you show your care, you show your concern, you show you're committed to talking about it, but you have time to process the situation, the information, and think about a positive response. John Gottman, who was a couple therapist, also says, when you want to talk about a conflict, start warmly, acknowledge the other person's hopes, desires, and challenges, express your care for them. When they feel understood and empathized with, and when we express our concerns in a kind and non-judgmental way, then they are much more relaxed. And this is often how Jesus related to people. He dealt with them with some really big issues, but he warmly connected with them, accepted them, loved them, forgave them, said he wanted to come and be in their house like Zacchaeus. And in his warm connection, they wanted to change. They wanted to do what, uh, what would please him because now they felt loved and cared for. Change your voice. The Bible says a gentle answer turns away wrath. And that's also because it lowers the cortisol in the other person's body. It lowers the stress. It helps them to experience oxytocin when our voice is soft and caring. And it helps them to engage with a positive cycle of conflict and emotions. So whisper, lower your voice instead of raising it. Speak calmly and kindly and use respectful language to help lower the stress. And then listen well. Sum up their ideas to check that you've understood them correctly. It sounds as if you, so you're saying that, or write down what they say on a sheet of paper so they can see it too. They need to know that you have listened carefully to all of their points. Listen to their viewpoint before you respond with yours, because that way they may be more likely to listen well to you. James 1.19 says, be quick to listen. And the more we listen actually and understand the other person, then it's often easier to solve our differences because we are building an understanding of the other person that often we love. And that's the goal of conflict, to help us get to know each other better, to understand why we're different, to appreciate those differences and to see them as strengths in the relationship because the more different we are, the more different ideas and creativity and skills we have to deal with life. And then we need to express our concerns warmly, politely, respectfully, clearly and collaboratively. And I often use this pattern when I'm trying to express a concern or when I'm helping couples to express their concerns politely, I give them this model and get them to write out what they would say and then read it to each other. And this helps to create a conversation an expression of need, which is warm and polite and respectful rather than nagging and ranting and raging at each other. In this specific situation, and that's important, be specific. When this specific thing happens, I feel because, and it would really help me if you would do this specific thing instead, and then I could help you by doing this. So you show that there's a mutual benefit from making a change. And then you say, this is just one idea. This is respectful. I, this is just one idea. So what ideas do you have? Because respect says, I want to hear your opinion too. That, and how could that help us work this out together? Romans 12, 10 says, honor one another above yourselves. And this is an honoring way to bring up a concern that shows care and love for the other person. And then we need to have an approach of, we can solve this together. 
it's really important, says Gottman, to admit your contribution to the problem, whatever it is. Share the responsibility for the problem and share the responsibility for solving the problem. This kind of language really, really helps. So when you're talking about the issue, use words like we and our and us. We can sort this out. Um, this is our problem. And these things really help. And then a bit like the we, the our and the us, which is inclusive, use the word and rather than but, because and is inclusive, but but is defensive. You want this and I want this. So I wonder how we can have some of both and how we can find a solution that will make us both happy and feel loved. So collaborate on mutually acceptable solutions whenever you can, whenever possible, find a way that you can um, solve your problems in ways that both people feel like that was a good solution. So when I say aim for win-win, that's not that you both get exactly what you want at the beginning, but you both win-win by finding a solution that you're both happy with, that may be a change from your original plan. Remember that it's more important to protect a valuable relationship than to win an argument. I have seen so many good relationships or relationships broken because one person wanted to win every argument. One person wanted to have all the control all the time and never let the other person speak, have a choice and participate in the, in the decisions. So when we win an argument, what happens is we often lose the vital trust and closeness in the relationship. The loser is hurt and sad and may distance themselves from the winner to feel safe. You think, I'm not going to have a conversation with you again if that's how it goes. Um, and it's really painful. So remember that when you think you've won, you've really lost the relationship. What's most important to you? Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, because he knows how it goes. When we do that, we hurt other people. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. And that's the unselfish spirit that Jesus came to show us. This is the, the maturity of character that is shown in our lives when we can work these things out together. You know, when we're arguing, often our brain is fighting a heart. We have these conversations where a rational brain and emotional heart are fighting and they can't come to an easy solution because they speak different languages. Um, and this happened to Bernie and I one time. We liked to have some, what we thought would be well-managed conflicts in front of our teenage children to show them that adults who love each other can have discussions, they can disagree, they can respectfully talk to each other in that disagreement and come to a win-win solution. So we started to have one of these conversations that we thought would go well, but it didn't. Something happened, it escalated, and we erupted all over the dinner table with our three teenage children sitting around staring at us. We didn't really notice what had happened until our middle son, Nathan, banged on the table. Stop, he said, stop, mum and dad. You're acting like children. You're both studying family therapy. You ought to know better. And we suddenly stopped and thought, ah, what was that? And then Nathan turns to Bernie and says, Bernie, dad, listen to mum with your heart. Like, listen to her feelings. They're really important. Show that you care for her. And I was feeling really proud of him. And then he turned to me and he said, and mum, listen to dad with your brain because he has some really sensible things to say. <laughs> Well, Bernie and I stood there very humbled by our teenage son and we realized this truth that I had been speaking heart and Bernie had been speaking brain and we couldn't find a common language to talk about the issue. And actually that's often what happens. So and when that happens, we need to listen to the emotions first, acknowledge them, be empathic and caring, calm the emotional distress, the un unbalanced emotions of fear, stress, um, embarrassment, shame, whatever's going on there that is making the situation worse and calm the emotional distress. And then when that's calm, you can both engage in a more rational discussion. And the person who is, whose feelings have become very big, um, they can feel calmed again, they can feel loved and safe. And then you can have a more rational discussion, but you need to help the emotional person 
feel safe first. And that's the way it has to go because they will not engage with their rational brain until they have been calmed. You need to understand that there's nothing wrong with the person who has stronger emotions. Um, their emotions happen to them. And often the person who is more rational may have triggered all of those emotions and caused them to become emotionally out of control by things that they were saying to them that just triggered them in ways they didn't understand. So we need to calm those emotions first and soothe each other and then start to have a more rational conversation. It can take about 40 minutes or more for the emotional part of the brain to calm down well enough. So don't just start off again and wait for that the, uh, brain to really calm down well enough. And maybe even wait for a day and say, let's, let's wait and talk about this. And we both had time to think about it. We're both calmer. We can both remember that we really love each other and that we want to grow closer together and let this conflict strengthen our relationship and not push us apart. So it's important to know how to soothe each other so that we can do this and we see that someone is actually getting more stressed and getting into the negative emotional cycle, the negative stress cycle of an argument. So help each other to calm down. Say, let's just sit down here quietly. Let me make you a cup of tea. Um, why don't we just take a break and, and go for a walk together and then come back and talk about this or whatever works for the relationship. Know how your loved one likes to be soothed, what calms them down. How can you do that? How can you let them know that you care, you appreciate them, you're committed to them, all those things that help them to experience positive emotions that will lower the intensity of the conflict. And if you can maintain a warm sense of humor, laugh about the situation, but not at each other. Because when we laugh, it opens up our minds we get soothed and relaxed, we experience positive emotion and humor actually helps us to be more creative and come up with better solutions for our problems and get plenty of sleep because tiredness can make you more irritable and argumentative, we've all been there. So make sure you protect your relationships by um, not having too much stress in your life, lowering the stress that you can eliminate um, getting plenty of sleep, making sure that your bodies are healthy, because that will all help you to feel calmer and more soothed generally, and be able to engage in more warm and loving relationships that will lower the conflict. We've all done this, I'm sure, coming up with a list of possible solutions. So when there's an issue and you're wondering which is the best solution, we can make a list of things and then score each thing out of 10. So one of you will rate your, each idea out of 10 and the other one will rate each idea out of 10. And then you add the scores together and see which has the highest score. And Bernie and I have done this when we're trying to buy a house or other big situations in our life to try and work out the best house or the best place to go on holiday or whatever else we're trying to deal with in our life. So when you've looked at these and scored them, choose a potential solution that will work best for both of you and agree on it together and agree that it's going to be an experiment. You're not committing to this change for all of your life. You're committing to try it for a week and see if it helps. And that makes it easier to say, oh yes, okay, well, we'll try your idea for a week. Then we'll try my idea for a week. And we put the two, um, what we learn from each of those, put the two together and then come up with the best win-win solution for us. So evaluate the ideas, improve on them or choose another option. There's a book called The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. And uh, it's about why good people are divided by politics and religion and why we argue about things. And he says this at the end of his book when he's explained the sort of the psychology about why good people are divided by politics and religion. We can all have good values, but actually interpret them at opposite ends of a spectrum. The next time you find yourself sitting beside someone from another matrix, he says, give this a try. Don't just jump right in. Don't bring up morality until you've found a few points of commonality or in some other way established a bit of trust. So what he's saying is make sure first you have a good relationship with someone before you try and have a conflict with them or bring up your very different ideas. Make sure you are first connected, attached, 
in a trusting relationship. And then he says, when you do bring up issues of morality, try to start with some praise or a sincere expression of interest, because that helps again to, to warm the context, warm the relationship up so that it's easier to, to talk about things that are different because you feel there is a safe base from which to speak. And finally, he says, we're all stuck here for a while, so let's try to work it out. And that's true, we're all stuck here for a while in this situation, so let's do our best to solve our conflicts really well. You know, conflicts don't just happen in the home, as we know. I'm sure all of us have experienced conflicts within our churches. And these are the things that why people often leave our church, not because they don't believe in what we say, um, but because the conflicts around them become so painful, it's too painful to come to church. It's too much effort. They are almost frightened to come because they don't know what conflict will erupt next. Who will come and criticize them and judge them or people are taking sides and it all becomes so emotionally challenging that it becomes easier just to stay at home and never go back there. But Ellen White says this in Selected Messages. When united with Christ, members will solve church problems with sympathy, tenderness and love. And those are the things I was talking about at the beginning, the things that create the atmosphere to talk about our differences in a healthy, positive way, or will completely lower the, the incidence of conflict within the community, because when we all feel cared for and loved and appreciated and supported, we are much less likely to get into arguments with each other. The Bible sets before us a model church, she said. People are to be in unity with each other and with God. And when believers are united in Christ, the living vine, the result is that they are one with Christ, full of sympathy and tenderness and love for one another. And this is what helps to create these positive communities where we reflect God's character in sympathy, tenderness and love. And I wonder how each of us can go to our churches and be channels of sympathy, tenderness, and love into those communities where we show appreciation for each other whenever someone is doing something in the church say thank you thank you for arranging the flowers playing the music tidying the church afterwards helping to prepare the potluck thank people as often as you can support them go and ask someone who looks like they're overwhelmed can i help you today can i help you do the children's sabbath school i can see that someone hasn't come to support you. Can I help you do this task in the church? Because I can see it's really big. When we support each other, then we create that atmosphere of love. So show appreciation, show support, be kind to one another as often as you can so that we can create communities that are filled with care. Communities where people experience God's love and feel safe. And there isn't criticism and judgment and conflict and pain when people come to church. Because these things are actually what Sue Johnson experienced when she studied couples, that the more they were caring and sympathetic and tender and loving to one another, the less arguments they had. It took her 25 years of research, but actually Ellen White says this and Paul in his own way says this and Jesus lives this out in his life too, the more loving and caring that we are, the more we care for one another, accept one another, appreciate one another, are kind to one another, then we create these communities where conflicts are less likely to happen. Don't you want to be in a church like that? And you know, if you are on a, in a church meeting or in a church board and you see a conflict erupting, stop and think, this person, is possibly hurting. Maybe these people are possibly hurting. I wonder if they feel appreciated. I wonder if they feel loved. I wonder if they feel supported. What can we do? Because often what is underneath the conflict is a cry of the heart for loving connection. And when we don't get it in a healthy way, then we can start to cry out for it because we need it so badly. And then Ellen White says this, when you do go to those who you think are doing wrong, that's who you think, they may not be, it's your perception. 
you must have the spirit of meekness and of kindness and be full of mercy and good fruits. This is how we are to resolve the conflicts. Again, we see kindness, mercy, um, doing good things for one another, humility. These are the attitudes that help us to resolve conflicts the way that God intended us to. And to listen to the other person, you may think they have done something wrong, but listen to them, hear their story first before you decide to uh, explain what you want or what you need or what should be done differently. Listen to their story, find out why they do things the way they do, because then you will get to know the person and hear their story first, support them, comfort them, appreciate them and see what difference that can make. You know, in life, there are some conflicts that are unresolvable and one person has to lose. You cannot do it both ways. Although a win-win is good, if one person wants to live in America and the other person wants to live in England, there is no middle ground. There is no way you can live and have both of those. So when that happens, the person who loses out, which sometimes the situations arise where this has to be, um, that person who's losing out needs as much compassion and understanding as possible from the person who is seen to have won, who gets you know, what they, their choice. Um, and so the person who, who wins needs to do everything they can to be compassionate, to support the other person, to help them find what brings them joy and comfort um, in their difficult situation. So maybe they agree that they can go back to England, you know, every six months you'll pay for a ticket, you'll come and have one of your holidays there every year, whatever it is that will help them live with what seems to be an unsolvable conflict. And in that way, we bear one another's burdens. So in summary, um, what we want to create is what we call a virtuous circle. A vicious circle is when people have negative emotions, they're already stressed, they go into a conflict, and then because each person is stressed, the conflict escalates, people don't show empathy, they start yelling at each other, becoming critical, trying to win, the voices get louder and louder and louder, and people get hurt, and it's harder for them to heal that situation. And the more they experience conflicts like that, the more fear there is in the relationship, the more stress, the more anxiety, the more negative emotions, which then are more likely to trigger another escalating conflict in the future. But a virtuous circle, when we have well-balanced emotions and well-managed conflicts can bring us closer together. When we see that when I'm different to you and I have different ideas and needs and views, we are both different, Let's understand each other better. Let's listen to each other and support each other and help us to develop unselfish ways where we both feel happy with the solution. That's what the win-win means. And um, because that way we create um, caring, understanding, we get to know each other better. We think, oh, okay, that's what they don't like or that's what I can do to help. Next time I'll do something different. And we understand each other in ways that can build a warmer, closer relationship. And when we do that, it leads to practical expressions of love and kindness that help to reduce the hurtful conflicts in our relationship. It won't eliminate them. You know, we all have arguments from time to time. We get tired. We forget to do all these things that we should do. And then after that, we need to make a good apology, mend the relationship quickly and seek forgiveness. But what we want to try and create is this virtual circle where when we have well-managed conflicts, we feel cared for, we feel loved, we feel closer together. And that loving care that we experience there, will build. we can build on that. And the next time, because our relationship feels happy and loved, we're less likely to have a difficult conflict in the future. We're more likely to have the relationship where we can manage our conflicts better because our stress isn't sky high. We're living in a kind, appreciated, understanding, supported relationship. And when that is all there, it's so much easier to talk through our differences in healthy ways. <clears throat> Jesus says this to us, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And I have told you this so that my joy may be in you 
and that your joy may be complete. <coughs> My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And as you've been listening to this today, I wonder what you've been thinking. I wonder what you can do differently that might change the course of your conflicts. How can you put more kindness, appreciation, commitment and support into the relationships around you so that you are less likely to have um, more difficult conflicts that escalate in ways that neither of you like? How can you be the peacemaker God calls you to be? How can you let the peace of God reign in your heart so that you're not the source of conflicts around you, but you find loving and kind ways to lower the tone with your gentle voice, with your care, with your kindness and understanding and your listening and be part of the peacemaking process. And I wonder what we can do together to create warm and caring churches and organizations and families where hurtful conflicts are less likely. It will take all of us to do that. And we can do this together. Finally, here are some useful resources. If you want to have some kindness resources, there are some on the website, the tedadventist.org. I used to work for the Scottish Conflict Resolution Organization as a volunteer trainer and alongside them in different ways. And they have an excellent website. There is an app called Two Can Together, which has mo modules on conflict. And there's Everybody Wins, the Chapman Guide to Solving Conflicts Without Arguing. Let us pray. Father God, today we have learned more about how to share our differences in ways that don't hurt each other, that are more likely to help us understand each other in the relationship, to experience love and appreciation and kindness and support. Pray that you'll take our hearts, inspire us, help us to come to you and be filled with your love so we can pass this peace on to others around us and be the peacemakers who are your children in this broken world. Through Jesus' name, amen. Are you struggling to cope with life? Conflict, bereavement, fear, relationship, anger, depression, negative thoughts, trauma, and uncertainty can all cause emotional imbalance. Don't struggle alone. CCS, your trusted confidential counseling service, is here for you. Call our listening line on 03301 332 945. Our office line for appointments on 020-7723-8050 or visit our website www.ccscounseling.org.uk Our counsellors speak various languages. CCS, a shoulder to lean on. We are here to listen. We want to thank Karen for that a very informative uh, presentation. Unfortunately, Karen couldn't be here to answer questions, but the team will try and answer your questions. We do have at least 10 minutes for question time. You can put your questions in the chat or you can just raise your hand and we'll recognize you. I'd like to ask a question, sorry. Okay. Sometimes you have a conflict with a member of your family and um, you try your best to resolve it. And then you find out that before you resolve that um, conflict, the person passes away. And then you can't really get your head around it. And you're still angry because that conflict hasn't been resolved. You know, because sometimes with these conflicts, we try to leave them, oh, we'll try and resolve them tomorrow. But tomorrow may never come. Mm. And it leaves us really in a situation of hurt, anger. Uh, how do we get around that? Anyone wants to answer that question, Tim? Um, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> uh, 
Um, thank you, Sister Sheba, for, for that question. Uh, very, very important question. Yeah, there are so many ways um, that you could um, deal with that issue. Um, I think the first thing is to recognize and appreciate that uh, um, the, the, um, the person whom you could have discussed, you know, um, the, the problem has passed on and that uh, um, there's no way, you know, you could deal with that issue. So the first thing is to acknowledge and appreciate that the individual is gone. And then now you come to say, okay, so what do I do? I've only got two um, options here. My colleagues would answer other options. The first one is because you know you, you are the one who is left with this emotional imbalance. Mm -hmm. So you could maybe write a letter. You just sit there, get a piece of paper and start writing what you could have said to this individual. Just write, you know, bringing out your imbalance emotions out because you know they will still be stuck in your body and that would cause you some anxiety and uh, other um, issues that could amount to that. Just, just write what you'd have loved to tell to the person. After writing, you could actually say it aloud because you are actually expressing what you'd have said to the individual. And then of course you can um, tear it out and maybe burn it. And the other way you could do it, maybe do the chair um, thing. Uh, my colleagues could uh, um, agree that with me or not, where you know you put a chair there and literally feel like the individual is there and then just say it out to say this is the way you'd have loved and then afterwards you can swap chairs and sit on the other chair and appreciate as to how this individual would have said the important thing is for you to express that anger that you would have to that individual because you know definitely you are not going to communicate because this person has died so those are the other two um, options that i thought i would share my colleagues can share other points which I, um, they have Thank you very much, Krista. Thank you. Another thing you could actually do is forgiveness. Forgiving yourself for not being able to conclude um, this issue, this conflict before the person died. And then forgiving the other person who's died. Because forgiveness is for you so that you are not carrying all this emotional baggage that's causing so much imbalance in your emotional imbalance in your life. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much. And prayer, of course. Oh, yes, definitely. Thank you. I think this is such an important thing. A lot of people face it either way, whether you're the one who was hurt or you are the one who hurt the person and then the person is no longer available for whatever reason for or sometimes they're not even wanting to hear you you know say so that they could still be alive but they don't want to have that conversation mm -hmm. and i think it's such a, it's, it's an important thing that we know that ultimately god forgives everything because I know the struggle that we have that sometimes we feel like if the person, we need to go to the person, have that conversation. And then they say, I forgive you and you forgive them. And then it's sorted. But when there isn't that person and to do that with, and we are the one where, who was wrong. For example, if you were the one who was in the wrong, that you know that even what, that even if that person is not there, when you go to God, he forgives you for your wrongdoing. And I think that the not forgiving ourselves is tied into thinking that God doesn't forgive us for the fact that, you know, we didn't even have a chance to say sorry, maybe to this person, but actually God has forgiveness for everything. And we can go to him and talk to him about what happened and he will forgive us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Gugu, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Hi. Hello. Um, so I have a question. Sorry um, if it's still okay to ask questions. Um, sure. My question is, so we're, we've heard all these wonderful things about what you can do in situations of conflict. And I think to be fair, a great many of us maybe know those things um, in, 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 like you, you know you're supposed to behave this way and you're supposed to do this to, to avoid conflict. Um, my question is, so all of us are, are really different and we all react to things very differently. So some of us are more passionate than other people and, um, and perhaps uh, would like to discuss things in the heat of the moment 
or would like to get it off our chest, as we say. Um, how do you, and I know you, maybe one of the things you might say is you have to practice the muscle to learn how to deal with things this way. So first of all, in a practical sense, how do people actually implement these things? Like, how do people actually say, you know what, I'm really mad, but I'm gonna wait. <laughs> I'm gonna wait till they've had their dinner and they're, you know, they've settled down or maybe I'll even wait until tomorrow um, to say this thing that's really upset me today. Um, also, say for example, Gugu decides she wants to be a different person. She's not really going to have that um, thing where she just decides, I want to deal with it now and I'm going to talk about it now and I'm going to learn how to you know, manage my emotions better, wait for the conflict to subside and do all these things that we've heard today. Um, and then I'm going to start my muscle to do that. How do you then manage the other person uh, perceiving that as being genuine? So one day Gugu is this passionate person who wants to talk about everything right there on the spot. And then the next thing she's trying to be this other person who is uh, slow to respond and maybe takes time or he, the person has just come from work or the person or whatever, let's, let's stop or they've come from school or whatever, let's stop and we'll discuss it later. H how do you then deal with that other person perceiving that as being a fake emotion or fake reaction from you? Um, I, I'll, I'll answer the first one, maybe somebody else can answer the second one, but I'll just say that, as you rightly said, uh, the practice actually makes, um, not perfect, but it makes progress practice makes progress and as you begin to do more of what you are what you are talking about it will become much easier i'll give you an example like we all had to wait to listen to you i know that you asked two questions but guess what somebody could have interrupted you and said oh i want to say something but they had to wait and breathe and wait for you to finish. And this is, a, 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 for example, in a conversation or in and a place where you're having a discussion with someone or you're having an argument and you may, the first time you do it, it would probably not be as easy to wait, give them a chance, let them speak before you do it, right? So you may actually struggle with that at the beginning. If your natural propensity is that you, you are bubbly, you, you, know, you talk, you're gonna jump in and say what you wanna say, that's fine. that is who you are, but you will find that as you practice, and often in therapy sessions, we do role play with people, and that's to get them to practice being in that place, practice what it feels like to have to say, walk away or say sit down when you want to stand and fight. So all those things do come with practice and you can do those role plays by yourself. You could actually do that on your own and say the next time this happens, what and, and play out the scenario before you get to that position. Play it out in your mind, make a decision how you are possibly going to react versus how maybe you may have reacted in the past. And as you do that in your mind, they say, even just practicing in our mind is as good as actually doing it. They've shown that with pianists and many other people that rehearsing something over and over again in our mind actually translates into actual practice when we finally have to do it. It's not as hard. So I would say just as a recommendation, rehearse what, you, what new behaviors you want to do and practice and then be patient with yourself it doesn't happen all, all of overnight. You will you will get there eventually, but rehearse it first. Practice, even if it means talking to yourself in the mirror, and practice walking away. Practice breathing and taking that deep breath, and 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 letting yourself relax and let those those like the high the the high emotions that we're in when those experiences are happening subside because they do. And as you allow them to subside, you will find yourself better able to think as well, you'll have more clarity. And then you're probably gonna find it easier to walk away, to wait. And sometimes the things don't even matter anyway, after a while to you when you've walked away. So practice first in your head, practice it verbally by yourself and, and then picture yourself actually succeeding. Picture yourself actually being able to do it. 
and say, yes, I can. Yes, I can do this. Because the more you give your mind that idea that this is possible and I'm able to do this, when you are now facing that situation, it's not an insurmountable situation to the mind. The brain will say, yes, we've done this before because you've rehearsed it and we were successful at it. And therefore we can do it now and you'll be fine. You will, you will make progress. You'll make progress. That's fantastic um, advice, Gita. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. I, I think the idea of practicing it is a really good one. I'll put that to use. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. She asked a second question. Yes, she had a question, which was, how do I convince the people around me that I've changed? Um, okay, I'll answer that. I was just going to say, with your practicing, people will see it. Um, so don't worry too much about trying to convince people actually feel it within yourself and it will transcend to everybody else I think that's the only thing you can do you can't show other people practically you've changed it's just got to happen and people will see it that's fantastic Hannah thank you so much <laughs> okay thank you and the next question we have is what do you do if the other partner has a history of struggling to share how do you resolve the, this issue um, <laughs> I think Karen gave us um, some pointers you know when you've got a, uh, a partner who is struggling to share so when you you you, are, you you've used the terminology struggling so that's the important key word there to say it, struggling so you kind of like look at when when what is it that is making them struggle to share could it be the timing that you want you to to discuss that the individual is struggling or could it be um maybe it's the wrong time so, you know, you, you kind of like look at your partner to say, the fact that I, I'm bringing up this conversation and my partner is struggling, it could be that uh, maybe the timing is not right, or maybe um, the partner hasn't really processed that conversation that you have, and they, maybe they still need more time, or maybe there's something else that they feel if they, they, they talk about what you want to share. They're looking at what the implications will be. So it's something whereby you, you kind of like assess and find out exactly what is it that is causing them to struggle. And once you could actually ask to say, you know, I feel that's what Karen was reminding us to say, maybe so that we could hear from both sides that I, I can sense that each time we want us to discuss something, um, I'm seeing that you are struggling. Is there something that um, you know, causing this, is it the way maybe I'm saying it or is it the wrong time or do you feel you know, we need to discuss that another time? And then you find that the partner will be able to say, um, or oh, maybe that's not the timing or maybe the partner is scared of the consequences of that issue. So kind of like look at the way do you view struggle and then they really unpack it as to find out exactly what is it that is causing uh, the struggling. And just to add on to that, sometimes it could be that the person is actually struggling with self-expression. They don't know how to express themselves. themselves. So that's another way of um, looking at it. Are they struggling to express themselves? Can you create an environment that is safe and secure for them uh, to feel free even to say, you know, I don't know how to express myself where they don't feel judged, where they feel accepted, where they feel that uh, their voice matter. So it's all those things to, to look at. Yeah, can I just ask, is there a way, um, I think I've been avoiding conflict permanently. <laughs> like my mom and my sister, I'm the oldest, they, they, oh, it's, it's, they're always in conflict. They live together still as adults, which is probably not good <laughs> for anybody. Um, so I try and avoid to take sides. And I do get where my mom's coming from in, in terms of where most of the arguments are coming from. But I don't want to add to it by taking sides and appearing to be on my mom's side. Um, but is that sustainable? Well, I, I'm obviously going to have to, you know, intervene or intermediate. But I just see, always see the conflict. I, I don't know if you've got any advice for that. I like the saying that um, avoiding conflict is actually delaying conflict because you'll have to face it, face it at one time or another. And it tends to cause some emotional baggage in you and it balances your own emotions as you are trying to avoid instead of um, just talking it through 
no thank you <laughs> yeah I, I hear what you're saying yeah. I was going to say that I think it's so important as you say to know which battles to fight so some of the battles are not yours you may have to like avoid being involved in certain things if you know yeah. and what I've learned those who love to fight are actually loving to fight and sometimes you think to you it may feel like you know but for them that's who they are and what they want to be doing at this time in their journey together and and so taking a step back and letting them deal with it because i've found myself sometimes in those situations and then trying to be the mediator realizing that in actual fact and then they keep it's like i don't want to use this uh, as a cliche especially here because as an example because it's not necessarily always a good one but have you seen those that couple that fights and then they just make up and and everyone is looking at them and thinking why is she still there or why is he still there right and it's because there's something there and until they resolve it themselves and work it out their form of communication this is their form of communication and doing things and sometimes you're 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 looking at it and thinking oh my goodness i wouldn't do that for sure and that's fine but if you let them be sometimes you would discover when you try and get in that space you become the enemy and you may discover that they actually, this is their way of being and it suits them. So, so I would recommend just choose your battles and, and, and lay off some of them. <laughs> Very true. I also would recommend that you kind of help each person to unpack it, not together, but unpack it themselves. So it's what mom is saying to you. How do you see what mom is saying to you? How do you see what daughter is saying to you? Don't try and resolve it when they're together because that's the way they communicate, okay? So just yeah. let them have an understanding of what each person is trying to say to each other. So when they do come together, maybe they can try and, and unpack it together. But your step, your step at the moment as the sister, as the daughter, is just to help mom to unpack it and help your sister to unpack it. I think that's the easiest way. And when I say unpack it, it's just basically, you know, what, what, what did mom say today? What did you hear? Did it sound okay? Did you like this? Was it, was it too controlling? Just keep asking questions so they can further ask themselves what they're trying to understand by that as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that would help you so you're not always stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm. Thank so. you. Thank you very much. So I, I, as Hannah mentioned that, you know, you, you deal with them separately. So when you are talking to the other one, just to ask to say, what did you hear mom say? You know, if she's able to repeat what mom said, and then you find that hey, maybe that's not what mom meant. She could have heard it differently from, you know, if she was, if she's able to say back, you know, to say, this is what mom was saying, you'll be, you'll be amazed because when you go to mom and find out to say, is this what you meant? Mom will be saying, no, that's not what I meant. You know, so that that helps, you know, to reflect back and also to mom to say, is this what you heard, you know, my sister saying, would you want to repeat what she said? And then mom would say, this is what she said. And then when you, she said, that's not what I meant. So it's also good for, you know, when you have the different versions of them to, to ask them to say, what did you hear my sister say? Let them repeat what she said, and you it will ju you will just be amazed to find out that uh, what she thought that what she said is not what she meant to say. We will close with prayer. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Shall we pray? Our oh, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning because of your kindness, your goodness, and mercies, because of the life that you have kept each one of us. Thank you for the presentation that was made before, the questions and answers that have been asked and answered. Lord, I pray that you will forgive us our trespasses. We are weak and many times we have conflict with our partners or wives or husbands or children or friends or workers, our fellow employees, but we come to you today that you will give us hearts of kindness hearts that, that uh, yell for peace, hearts that want to make peace with others, peace uh, that passes all understanding. And so today, your Lord, uh, baptize us anew and make us yours holy, uh, mentally, spiritually, and physically. And thank you for these uh, moments of camp meeting week. I pray that many will see you, many will come to know you more in Jesus Christ you sent. So thank you, Father. 
that you have prepared a place for us. One day, Jesus will come to take us home. So help us that we may uh, make our commitment and election sure that we invite others in this journey uh, where we prepare uh, together with them to see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. Thank you and help us that tomorrow we can come again together and hear from your servants and help us that we can live changed lives that can bring us together and make us light in the communities where we live, help our churches to be places of safety and places of uh, healing. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Amen.